So thank you for inviting me to join this distinguished panel today to discuss peace and justice. It's an honor to share the dais with such distinguished human rights defenders who have played a critical role in supporting Nepal's efforts to establish a sustainable peace through their advocacy and through their activism. And I'm delighted, Secretary General, that you have chosen this time to visit and to encourage national and international peace efforts here uh, and for your very thought-provoking remarks just now. The British government is proud to be associated with ICJ through funding for your excellent work here and in other countries around the world. The international community here, including the UK, has a necessarily limited formal role in the peace process. The UN mission, UNMIN, has a key role in monitoring the Nepal and the Maoist armies, um, and most visibly at the Maoist cantonment sites around the country. And OHCHR, which has made a real difference to the protection of human rights since its establishment in 2005, was invited by the peace parties to monitor the human rights provisions of the Comprehensive Peace Accord. For our part, we can and do use our influence where we can in favour of a peace process based on respect for human rights and the rule of law. We do this through supporting organisations like ICJ who try to break down the barriers of impunity and to support the development of transitional justice institutions. We also discuss impunity and the rule of law with government on a regular basis. For example, I have raised attacks on journalists with the Home Minister in a discussion a few days ago. We also have a regular dialogue with political party leaders, including Maoist party leaders, on the need to uphold democratic principles, to renounce violence in all circumstances, and not to shield their own members from proper accountability. We also draw the world's attention to individual cases. As one example, last December, I and representatives of eight other embassies in Kathmandu, some of them are here today, visited Bardia, where over 200 people were disappeared from their homes, some by the Maoists, many more by the security forces. As you've just seen, we made a documentary of that visit, and it's really heartbreaking to see uh, the comments of those victims there. We made it because we hope it will be an advocacy tool. We hope that if decision makers in Kathmandu can see for themselves the anguish caused by the failure to deliver for justice, that it will change attitudes and stiffen the resolve of policymakers and legislators to take action. It's true that the international community cannot champion every case of human rights violations that tragically occurred during the conflict. That is for invaluable organisations such as the National Human Rights Commission, ICJ, Advocacy Forum, and those represented by other participants here today. Diplomats aim to focus minds around cases that are representative of the weak state of the rule of law and hope that we can thereby find traction. The Bardia disappearances are but one particularly troubling example of the state's apparent lack of will to address conflict-era crimes. Another is that of Maina Sunwa, the 15-year-old girl snatched from her home, brutally tortured and murdered six years ago. Maina's case strengthens the impression that access to justice can be denied and thwarted when the perpetrators, in this case the Nepal army, hold positions of power and influence. The Maoist party has likewise been responsible for some appalling abuses and has similarly evaded its responsibilities and refused to be held accountable. All we say is that the rule of law must apply equally to all. I do not accept the false notion that peace can only be achieved by compromising on justice. The UK's own experience in Northern Ireland shows exactly the opposite. Following years of a security approach, policy shifted towards increased respect for human rights and a willingness to examine past abuses. This laid the foundation for a constructive dialogue and negotiation that resulted in a political settlement. Experience from fragile states also supports the view that justice must be an integral part of a peace process and not something that can be got around to later. Equally wrong is the view that the best way to deal with a painful past is to forgive, to forget, to move on. In my view, to deny justice is to deny reconciliation, to undermine the rule of law, and thereby to sow the seeds for future conflict, and thus ensure that Nepal can never move on. Nor should we accept the argument that prosecutions should only be pursued as part of a transitional justice process. 
Crimes like those in Bardia, as much as atrocities committed by the Maoists, such as the Mahdi bus bombing, should be dealt with now. Waiting for special frameworks to be put in place has the effect of delaying and thereby denying justice to the victims and their families. The British government attaches the utmost importance to human rights and justice in its dealings with all Nepalese institutions, including the Nepal Army. As the chief of the British Army told his Nepali counterpart last month, our relations with the army continue to be constrained by its non-cooperation on human rights. The army's approach is at odds with the Nepal government's own political commitments and its international obligations. It's regrettable that the Nepal army, despite the damage that this does to Nepal's international reputation, as well as its own reputa reputation as a professional, legally compliant organisation, continues to put obstacles in the way of due legal process in cases such as minor sunrise. While this obstruction continues, it will inevitably have an impact on our ability to conduct the normal relationship which we would like to enjoy. As one example, I felt compelled to postpone a human rights symposium that was due to start today. This would brought together representatives from all the security forces, the ministries concerned with justice, national and human international rights commissions, and the domestic human rights organisations. But while one key participant shows such little sign of good faith, it is difficult to believe that such a workshop will have the positive effects which we naturally want to see, or that even the substantial costs involved can be justified in mounting such an operation. I very much hope this situation will soon change and that we can then look again at our level of cooperation. I sometimes hear the argument that the international community is one-sided in its approach. Some say that as long as Maoist criminals continue to roam free, it is wrong to pursue justice in the case of army personnel. But justice is not divisible or partial. Justice in post-conflict situations is not about going after one side or the other. The point of the peace process here is that both sides have come together for the greater good of Nepal. And the government must recognize that truth, justice, and reconciliation are an immediate and an important pillar of the comprehensive peace agreement and ensure that both Maoist and state actors account for the past. Only then will Nepal's international friends have confidence that a lasting, rights-based peace is at last within reach. Thank you very much.